So because the americium-241 decays to this level 85% of the time, 85% of the time, that Q value for the alpha, even though it's 5,637, the actual energy associated with the decay is going to be 59 keV less. So you have to subtract this from the Q value to figure out how much energy is actually available to go with the kinetic energy of the daughter and of the alpha particle. Because some of this energy, this, this much energy, 59.537 keV, is going to be tied up in the nucleus itself of the daughter in terms of the energy of the nucleons. So ground to 59.537 keV, which again happens about 85% of the time. 5637.81 minus 59.537 times 237 over 241 gives us the 5486 keV, just about. And when we look at the alpha spectrum that we can see from this decay, the labels are not always perfectly matched up, but we see this label here, this 5.545 matches up with that peak. That's our ground to ground decay, okay? And we could see that the number of events under that peak is very small compared to the number of events under this 5.486 MeV peak. So the 5.486 MeV peak, this is the alpha particle that is associated with the decay of americium-241 to the 59.537 keV energy level of the Neptunium-237 daughter. So this alpha matches with this gamma, okay? You could go through this energy level diagram and you should be able to say okay if i go now to this 102.96 level 12.8 percent of the time well now my 5637.8 kev q alpha is gonna have 103 kev less available to split into the kinetic energy of the alpha and of the daughter. So you would go back to the subtraction you did here, and instead of subtracting the 59.5, you would subtract the 103 keV, okay? And then you could still correct to figure out what's the energy of the alpha particle you would expect to see there. And it's, the 54, 5.443 is what you should see from that one. This one here. And notice in parentheses after those peaks, this, the source of this spectrum was very nice and they labeled each of those peaks with the percentage that's associated with the decay. So this peak, this 5.443, this is about 12.7% of the decays of that americium-241. And you can come back to the level diagram and you can see that that matches. These come from different times and different sources, so they may not match perfectly as more research is done and the numbers get updated. 
but you can match that to that particular energy level. The 1.4% should match to something else on our spectrum. What energy alpha would you say you should be seeing for that decay? Five point three eight nine. That's it. And notice that that five point three eight nine MeV is not exactly equal to what you would get for this Q alpha minus this energy, because remember, a part part of that kinetic energy goes with the daughter as well. So you can't just take the Q alpha minus the energy level and call it a day. Okay, you do have to do that correction for the conservation of momentum and energy. Could you re-explain that correction? I didn't catch where she got the number from. The 5.389? Right. So in this case, this is labeled on the spectrum. And then actually this figure, in, in, in fact, is showing one of the things I was discussing in class today, which is often you might just get channel numbers. That's what you're gonna get from a detector in terms of your raw data. You'll get a, a, a set of channels, you'll have a channel number and you'll have some number of counts in that channel. And then it's up to you with that raw data or with the software to calibrate that spectrum yourself. So when you guys do the lab, this is for the labs, not for lecture. You're not gonna to have to calibrate a spectrum on the exam, okay? When you do labs, you're gonna have a source of known energy, the known decay energy. And if you were doing this for um, alpha decay, plutonium-244 is used sometimes as a standard. Um, americium 241 can also be used as a standard if you know the energies of the alpha particles that come off of that isotope and you've got something you know what it is then you would put it in your detector you would say okay i know the intensities what the relative intensities of these peaks should be relative intensities so you assign specific energy values to those peaks and you say well this peak at 5.389 mev is really more like 147 for my channel number. And this peak at 5.443 is really like 164 for my channel number. And as long as you've got at least two points, you could do point slope to get your calibration curve. In reality, you would do more points and you would do some, some sort of least squares fitting, which is easy to do in Excel. Or a lot of spectroscopy software, you plug in the channel number and the associated energy and it builds a calibration curve for you. And then when you look at that curve in the spectra software, or when you look at your raw data with your calibration curve, your known calibration, then you can associate those channel numbers with specific energies for some other unknown source. So the gamma spectrum that's on the left you see other energies there besides the 59.5. You see a 26, a 20, 17, 13.8. What do you think those energies are associated with? Would those be the less common gamma, like so that alpha decay goes to that gamma ray or that like metastable state? less often so you're saying like this 33.195 for instance this one here um uh, i don't know where you're pointing at because your screen share is on the other thing right now but oh no so everything <laughs> is this thing you guys weren't even seeing because i didn't flip it back 
So I kept trying to, this was what I was trying to talk you guys through. I'm sorry I wasn't on here with the alpha. No. Okay. That's where I drew, was drawing to show the channel number. <laughs> Let's see, nobody was seeing that. Is that more clear now, Karis? I was gonna say, yeah, I guess I should have pointed that out, but I felt like it was a calculation that was just like done in her head or something, in Megan's head. So I was just like, oh, okay, I guess I just didn't get that. Okay. I was, looking at, I was looking at the slides, mm -hmm. so. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we see here, we see a 26, a 20, a 17.7, a 13.8. These are all lower, lower energy than the 59.5, but there's really only one other level here between the 59.5 and the 33, right? And it's this, or the zero, the ground state, and it's this 33.192. And we don't see any gamma rays of that energy. At Those would actually be the, um, the other ways that the gamma rays were interacting, right? So instead of doing the photoelectric effect, like that highest one, that would be like the Compton scattering and stuff, right? Um, well, let's calculate that real quick. So now I will switch back over to my paper. So let's say my energy of my gamma is 59.5 keV. So the equation for my Compton scattering is E gamma prime, the energy of the scattered gamma ray is equal to the incident energy of the gamma ray divided by one plus E gamma over MC squared times one minus cosine theta. And if you're looking for the Compton edge, then you're saying that that theta is 180 degrees. If theta is 180 degrees, then cosine of 180 degrees is negative one. One minus negative one is two. So my Compton edge well, not my edge itself, but the gamma associated with the edge is E gamma over one plus two times E gamma over MC squared. And for that MC squared, normally we're gonna be thinking in terms of 511 keV for the electron. There's no re reason why you couldn't do MeV if you wanted, but gamma rays are typically reported in keV. So for our americium, we just need to plug in the 59.5 for our original gamma ray energy. So not the edge itself, but the gamma ray that scatters at 180 degrees What would the energy be of that gamma ray, assuming it's coming from americium decay? 48.26 keV. 48.26. So we should see a Compton edge somewhere in there on that spectrum on the left, right? Uh, which spectrum? I, it's the. Oh. The spectrum on the left on the slide that I keep forgetting to switch back to. But there's not really a Compton edge, right? So what does that mean for your detector? Well, it probably means for your detector that one, the detector is probably big enough where these low energy gamma rays either are completely interacting through the photoelectric effect. Because remember, Compton scattering is not as likely at low energies or very high energies. It kind of peaks in the middle for its probability. Or the detector itself is so large that anything that does Compton scatter still ends up depositing all of its energy within the crystal. 
okay? So then how much energy would be deposited? Well, oh, wait, sorry, no, wait a minute. The 48.26 was the energy of the gamma ray, right? So the original gamma ray was 59.5 minus 48.26 gives me like 11.24. And maybe there might be a little bit of an 11.24 down here but not much, right? So even though I went off talking about the Compton edge with the 48.26 and that wasn't the Compton edge, that whole explanation would still be true. So then the 13.8, the 17.7, the 20.7, the 26.34, we're not really seeing those coming from anywhere in our energy level diagram, right? And if you want to be certain that you're not missing something, it's a lot to look through and you wouldn't have to have a chart this big to look through on the test, but these are all the bold numbers. You would want to look at all the bold numbers associated with all these little transitions. And those bolded numbers would be the energies of the, of the transitions. So those would be the energies of the gamma rays coming off. But all these are really, really low intensities. They have a very low probability of occurring. And none of them are really in the right range for those energies that we're trying to see, right? None of them are like 13 or 17 or 20. You see another one up here that's like a 38.5. So are you saying the bolt numbers are what represent the, um, the beginning of, the, of that spectrum? or that those peaks aren't even seen in this table those because would be, they aren't a result of transitions. Those bold numbers off of all of those little arrows, those bold numbers associated with each arrow, that is the energy of that transition. And so anything going through that transition, if the nucleus was at that energy level and decayed to some other one, that bold number would be the energy of the gamma ray that comes from it. But the numbers in front of those bold numbers are your relative intensities. You can think of those almost as percent, percents. So the relative intensity for our 59.5 is a 36. So basically 36% of the time when an americium 241 decays, we're going to see this 59.5 keV gamma ray. But the intensities with all these other peaks are super low. I mean, I think the largest relative intensity other than the 59.5 keV is that 2.41 right next to it the 26.3 keV right here but even that one the 26.3 is super tiny here on our spectrum. I right? found the 13.81 on the on that last graph. Found a 15.81? No, 13.81. Oh, relative intensity or energy? The transition energy, I think, like the bold numbers. Yeah. Oh yeah, I see what he's talking about. It's Where like, is that one? It's a super small one, but halfway down the chart. Halfway down. Oh, I see it. That is there. That's interesting. 13.81. And notice though, oh, that is there. Cool. There's no relative intensity given with it. So that's kind of interesting but we do see it there in our gamma spectrum. So at least that one looks like it's coming from the decay. What about the others? Are they too big to be like backscattering or the annihilation peaks? I don't know. Okay. They could be backscatter 
They could be x-rays, okay? Okay. I have like for the annihilation peak, uh, 0. 0.511, but I guess that would be in kill, that'd be in- That would be an MEV. Mm -hmm. Okay. So right. this 59.5 keV gamma does not have enough energy to produce. Oh, right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And then this one, we kind of blew through, but same kind of thing in terms of looking at the energy level diagram, where you can see the percentage of decays that go to a particular level. Almost all of the decays of this cobalt 60 go to this first level here. But then almost all of those decay by emitting this 1173 which would be here. And when those decay to this level here, they in turn decay by emitting that 1332. So cobalt 60 is another gamma ray source that you might actually use to calibrate a detector, okay? Because on its own, this source actually gives you two peaks that you can use for your calibration. Now you generally also only want to calibrate from photo peaks. You don't usually want to start trying to do calibrations with the Compton edges, even though you can calculate what those energies are because that's not a sharp peak, okay? You also don't want to look and do, um, I'm not going to say what it is. Can you figure out what the peak down here is? coming from in this spectrum? I, I'm only giving these as guesses, sadly, but I want to say backscattering or um, annihilation. Backscatter is the best guess because of the shape of that peak, okay? Because it does stretch to higher energies, but it's kind of sharp on the low end, that sharp edge on the low energy is basically the minimum energy gamma ray that can come back into the detector from backscatter. That's for a gamma ray that comes into the shield, scatters at 180 degrees, because remember 180 degree scatter deposits the most energy in the scattered electron. So that's the gamma, the scattered gamma is the scattered gamma with the least amount of retained energy. For your um, escape peaks or something like that, for one thing, you'd have to have pair production for sure. And these gamma rays are capable of doing pair production, but um, we don't see, it doesn't look like we see a peak in here for um, the 511 KEV, which is what we would expect to see if they were um, doing pair production in the shielding and then an annihilation gamma was getting into the detector. Um, so even though they're capable of doing pair production, they're still relatively low energy for doing pair production, okay? They, pair production starts to get, become a bigger deal around say 3000 keV, and it becomes the dominant mode of energy transfer above 5000 keV. Speaking of that, in the connecting that back to the two MEV mercury droplet problem, in that case, um, could we have? Was it valid to say that pair production basically wouldn't have occurred in that case? And if it had, that would be why the energy didn't completely transition from the gamma ray to another. You could certainly say that it's low probability, and basically say that your assumption is that you're gonna rule that out as something that you would consider um, for a test question. I would still expect you to state it as a possibility, even if that probability is, is low, it's not impossible, okay? So um, these were scanned in, but I, I pulled this up just since you asked about it. So, I mean, you could use symbols like this, especially also if you're trying to label the peaks, you could use PE to represent photoelectric, you could use CS to represent Compton scatter, you could use PP to represent pair production, okay? 
Um, single escape, I think on my thing, I used SE to represent. So this was like the other, this is the Scandium question. And yeah, wow, those spectra are pretty busy, right? But here you've got like a single escape peak. So if you had lose one of those annihilation photons, you would be 511 keV lower, okay, or 0.511 lower. So for our, let me come back to the cobalt real quick. For the cobalt spectrum, if you tried to look 511 keV lower, you should be somewhere pretty close to the halfway point on that Compton continuum. Or if the 1332 was losing one, you would be a little bit higher than that. But we're not really seeing those escape peaks, okay? So there's two conclusions you could draw from that. One, there's not a lot of pair production occurring. Or two, if there is pair production occurring, none of those photons are really escaping. None of the annihilation photons are escaping. So this is either a big detector. And to me, this looks like it, with this spectrum here, looks like it would be from a sodium iodide detector. Whereas this spectrum here for the americium looks like it would be from maybe hyperpure germanium or at the very least a semiconductor detector. Notice how sharp the peaks are here compared to here. Even though they're totally different diagrams and it might not be great to compare them, but okay. So nuclear chemists love the hyperpure germanium because you get super sharp peaks. They're kind of a pain because you have to use the liquid nitrogen and overall they've got lower efficiency. So you don't get as many events. So if it's really important for you to capture that one decay that only happens once an hour, then you might wanna use sodium iodide as a scintillation detector. Um, if you have a lot of decays happening and it's more important that you have the resolution to tell the difference between different energy gammas, then the hyperpure germanium would be the way to go. So that was the single escape peak which we don't really see. So let me bring you back to the merc mercury droplet since that's kind of how we got on that in the first place. Um, I would still expect you to say that it's a possibility because you're above the threshold energy. But if you wanted to say something more about it, you might say that it's not as likely as say the Compton scattering. So at this energy, Compton scattering is going to be the most likely mode of energy deposition. Once you undergo one scatter, you could undergo a second scatter, a third scatter, etc. But once you undergo one scatter, you might also undergo the photoelectric effect. So the scattered photon that deposits 1773 keV, that scattered photon is still going to have about 227 keV of energy but now you're in the energy range where the photoelectric effect is more likely than Compton scattering. Compton scattering could still occur, but, okay. Certainly less than one MeV, you should not bring up pair production at all because you would be below the threshold energy for that. What else are you guys wondering about? I was kind of wondering just like in general, how would you decide like which of these detectors to pick? Because I guess, I don't know, it all kind of seemed like one big blob to me of detectors. <laughs> so, I mean, or. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. So kind of, the first thing you want to think about is what kind of radiation are you trying to detect? So if you know you're trying to detect, say, alpha particles, well, then you want to rule out Geiger counters. You usually want to rule out scintillation or um, germanium detectors, so sodium iodide or hyperpure germanium. You want to rule those out because they're not going to be sensitive to alphas. What scintillation detector could you use to detect alphas?
proportional. Am I not sharing this? I'm still sharing my handwritten sheet. I did it again. Here's our cheat, fast, and good. So let's say you're detecting alphas. Did you say which one it was, Karis, that you could use? Yeah, I said proportional counter. You could use proportional. Mm -hmm. That's Pers not scintillation, but it, you could use that. What else could you use for alphas? Uh, liquid scintillation. Mm -hmm. And the third one I would say you could use for alphas. There's really, a, there's really two more, but there's really only one more that is the ideal. Uh, the surf bar. <laughs> yeah, so the surface barrier, sorry for that abbreviation, surface barrier or ion implanted semiconductors would be good. You could technically use an ionization chamber, but um, yeah, they're pretty lame. So um, in my opinion. Um, so depending on what you want to do then. So proportional counting is going to pretty much give you the total activity, but it's not going to tell you what the energy of the individual alpha particles is. Liquid scintillation would be great for counting very low energy alpha particles or for telling the difference between two types of alpha particle energies, but you wouldn't want to use it to do a whole lot of spectroscopy. If you tried to run that americium-241 on liquid scintillation counting, you wouldn't be able to resolve all of those individual peaks. You would have one big blob for your, all of your alphas, okay? So if you wanted to do alpha spectroscopy, then that pretty much means you're doing the surface barrier or an ion implanted semiconductor. Gamma rays, you've got a couple choices for gamma rays. You've got three choices technically for gamma rays. Let's just say you wanted to know how much of a sample was there. And that particular sample, let's say it's technetium 99M. So it's only undergoing isomeric transformation. It's only emitting a gamma ray. The technetium 99 ground state has such a long half-life, you're not really gonna pick up on its decays. So you've got a bunch of gamma rays coming off and that's it. What could you use? Uh, high purity geranium. Or sodium iodide. Or the sodium iodide. The cheapest one you could use would be the Geiger counter, okay? So the way the Geiger counter works for gamma rays is that the gamma ray is not interacting within the gas, but the gamma ray interacts in some way with the electrodes or the can of the detector, so that, or the shell of the detector, causing secondary electrons to be ejected, and it's those secondary electrons from the gamma ray that then cause the cascade in the Geiger counter. Um, it would work, it wouldn't be super efficient, but you could certainly calibrate it for technetium 99M so you could use that to figure out how much you had. Other than that, the sodium iodide really would be the best way. So I, I believe most uh, dose calibrators and such um, are, there's two ways they could be designed. They can either be like an ionization chamber or they can be like a scintillating crystal. And that scintillating crystal you can tune with the electronics to focus in on a particular energy. Um, that would be like doing a single channel analyzer where you kind of give it a cutoff and you say, between this energy and this energy, I want to count everything in that range. And you could do that for the technetium 99M. The germanium would be pretty expensive. There wouldn't be any, really any reason to use that for the tech 99M if you know that's what you've got. The main reason to use the hyperpure germanium is to do identification of mixed sources or an unknown sample um, that's emitting gamma rays. And when you say um, calibrate the GM counter, do you mean like use a sample with a known activity to figure out like what your efficiency is and then use that? Yeah, so when I, when I was mentioning calibration, what I really meant is energy. So if you know the energy coming off, if you know you've got a cobalt 60 source, it doesn't matter what activity it is. If you know you've got a cobalt 60 source, you know what two energy gamma rays are coming off, and that means you can calibrate your spectrum in terms of energy. And that's really all you need for identification. 
Now, if you want to be quantitative to say how much of something is there, then exactly you're right, where you would need to know the activity of your calibrating source so that you could go through and calculate what the absolute efficiency was for your setup. I was going like, yeah, efficiency. Is that part of your lab that's due tomorrow? Or you guys did it in the lab last week? Uh, I don't know if we had any efficiency this last lab. I hope not. <laughs> yeah, okay, no, that's good. We're always doing like two to three labs at once. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Um, I mean, that's, you know, it's always kind of a trade-off between these. I mean, cost is always kind of in the back of your mind, but um, generally you're weighing these, um, these characteristics, the sensitivity, resolution, timing, and efficiency. So if you're trying to do spectroscopy and you're trying to determine the identity of an unknown, then you want good resolution. If you kind of know what you've got and you're just trying to figure out how much is there, then the resolution is not as important. I mean, it's nice to have to kind of like double check. So if, you, if you've got something that emits gamma rays and you kind of know what it is and you're trying to figure out how much is there, then the sodium iodide would be great. Um, Dr. Boros was talking about your radiochemical separation techniques and, and analysis techniques. And when you do the liquid chromatography, the liquid chromatography as your detector, you can actually have your um, elution, your eluent flowing past a sodium iodide detector. And that detector will pick up on the gammas that are emitted as your sample passes by. In that case, you generally know what you're eluting. You're not worried about trying to identify what it is. Instead, you're looking for something that has better efficiency so that you can um, more accurately calculate, more uh, precisely calculate the known activity that's present. You could not use like a proportional counter for liquid samples like that because there's really, you need the sample to be open to the gas chamber within the proportional counter. Um, you could use a Geiger counter, but um, that would depend on having mostly things like betas come out. Of course, you could still use it for gamma, but sodium iodide would be better then for something like a LC with a radiation detector. Liquid scintillation requires you to dissolve your sample. So liquid scintillation counting is a destructive analysis technique. Whereas hyperpure germanium or sodium iodide, you could take your sample, your rock, your, your pot shard, whatever it is, and you could put it right in front of the detector to measure the energies of stuff coming off of it. Liquid scintillation, you'd have to destroy it to dissolve it and get it in solution. Surface barrier is tricky with certain samples because you've got to be able to fit your sample into that vacuum chamber. So why would it be important to pull a vacuum down if you're trying to do alpha spectroscopy or low energy beta spectroscopy? Is it because um, alpha particles can have interactions with the air molecules? And so you don't want to have any of that to interfere with it. Right. Yeah, it'll increase the main free path, right? Vacuum, so. Yeah, pulling a vacuum increases the mean free path, increases the distance that alpha particle can travel. In fact, I scrolled back, I think it's still up, right? I think I'm still on the PowerPoint, yeah. Um, I scrolled over here to the americium alpha spectrum. So when you see these alpha peaks, they're not perfectly symmetrical. One of the reasons why not only do they have some uh, non-line characteristics, not only do they have a little bit of kind of a Gaussian peak with them, but notice that it also kind of looks like they're tailing off more on the left side of the spectrum. So the alpha particle, let's say that 5.486 MeV alpha particle comes out from a decay. If that's right at the surface of your sample, then that's the energy that that alpha particle has when it reaches your detector. But if that's just a little bit below the surface of your sample, when that alpha particle passes through that top of the sample, that it has to pass through to get to the detector, it's going to lose a little bit of its energy. And so the more sample it has to pass through, the more energy it loses. 
And that's why all these peaks tail off to the left side of the spectrum, okay? So for like alpha spectroscopy, you want your sample to be as thin as possible. Any thickness that your sample has is gonna mean that you, your peaks spread out more. And if your peaks spread out too much, then you might see that 5.486 peak, but you wouldn't be able to resolve the 5.443 or resolve the 5.389, okay? So this spectrum for this americium, for instance, comes from an extremely thin sample. And Dr. Boros today talked about co-precipitation. And typically to do something like this with an actinide, you would co-precipitate it with a cerium, which we always call a carrier, but according to her term terminology, it would be a scavenger since it's not the same element as the americium. So you would co-precipitate the americium with the cerium, you do this in like a hydrofluoric acid solution, kind of tricky to work with. And um, you wanna co-precipitate that and get it onto a filter paper as thin as it can possibly be. And you want your precipitating particles to be as small as they can possibly be so that your alpha spectrum can be as sharp as it is. The other thing she mentioned today that I think was in my IRM talk, but I thought I'd go back to it. Yeah, it's in the IRM talk, not the detectors. Was the um, resolution for positron emission tomography. I didn't realize it was gonna come up quite so soon. I told you it was definitely gonna come up when you got to the um, nuclear medicine week, but she happened to mention that today too. And thought it was here. Yeah, there it is. Share. That was this picture that I showed you with interaction of radiation with matter. She happened to mention that some particular nuclide, I can't remember which one she said, had low energy positrons. And because those positrons had low energy, they weren't going to travel very far away from the nucleus where they were formed. So if your nucleus and your annihilation event are right next to each other, then that gives you super good resolution. If that beta particle, if that positron has more energy and it can travel further away from the nucleus, well now don't just think about it as traveling in a straight line, even though they never travel in a straight line anyway. But now that positron can get further away from the nucleus picture a spherical area and that spherical area now is where that annihilation can occur. And so the spherical area where your annihilations occur gets larger as the positron energy goes up, which gives you lower and lower resolution for the positron emission tomography imaging. So that was just connecting back to the interaction of radiation with matter and how we think about these particles moving through materials. So there was already a connection back to this for you guys. What other questions do you have right now? What else can I help you out with? I have a quick question about the decay chain problem, 31 in the handout. Yeah. Oh. What was your question about that? How do I go about determining the different ages? I've tried looking in the chart of the nuclides just to get started, but I'm kind of confused. So um, the uranium thorium lead systems, how many different ages could you get? This would be Um, that is pretty much this slide. So You've got the thorium to lead 208, you've got the uranium 238 to lead 206, and you've got the um, uranium 235 
to lead 207, from which you could get three ages, okay? Now that last one that I said, the uranium-235 to lead-207, instead of doing that one directly, sometimes they use the 207 as kind of a stand-in for the uranium-235, and they compare that back to the lead-206. So I would say you should be able to calculate three different ages using this uranium-thorium-lead system. Okay. You might be able to do some manipulation with numbers to get some different ages, but in, they're always going to somehow be related back to the thorium-232, the uranium-238, or the uranium-235. Okay. You are getting that from the number of charts that can be formed? Yeah. And looking at, even though I gave you four nuclides here in this table, the idea that the uranium-234 is really a part of the uranium-238 decay chain. So even though it looks like there's four starting points, one of those four really starts with a different nuclide. Anything else? What else? Um, I wanted to clarify real quick what, um, how we can determine what is a younger age versus an older age, because based on the relationships from lecture, it just seems kind of counterintuitive. So I just wanted to clarify like that I am thinking about it correctly. So um, this was the one I think where that first came up, right? So I happen I to mention so? on this plot, at least, with the uranium-238 and the lead-206 ratio, right, on this isochron. So if you happen to lose some uranium from your samples, but you retained the lead, then that would move your points closer to the y-axis, right? That would give your slope, if you could draw a straight line through those points, Let's say, that that, let's say that that straight line has a steeper slope, right? If, you, if your straight line has a steeper slope, then that's going to make it look like your time is longer. So the age is older. It makes it look like more of the parent has decayed away. If you, it looks like more of the parent has decayed away and you have more of the daughter, then that would be associated with an older age. So notice for a given lambda, your slope is always going to be steeper with higher times. And for any given set of samples, if they work for an isochron for determining the age, a steeper slope is going to be associated with an older or a longer age, a longer decay time. Not a longer half-life, just an older sample. Okay. If you have something happen that removes your daughter from your sample, so picture, um, picture the top plot here. And let's say that the... Some of those points I circled just to show that they were, even though they were a little bit off the line, something happened to them, but not enough where it really changed the line that much. But let's say all of these lost a little bit of lead or some portion of lead so that your line was more like that. That's a bad line, but that would have a lower slope. A lower slope would be associated with a smaller T in your E to the lambda T. So a smaller T, a shorter time, that would be a younger sample, okay? So if you lose parent, it makes it look like the sample is older. If you lose daughter, it makes it look like the sample is younger. Now you might also have some other kind of an event occur where maybe it's not that you lost material, maybe what was already there 
got mixed in with some other material that was already itself older or younger or had more lead or had more uranium. And that is also going to then change the apparent age of your sample. What other questions can I help you with? In all honesty, I'm just going to review all the information I have right now. There will be an hour tomorrow. Um, it'll start at um, 7.30 Pacific. I know that's a little bit early. It'll start at 10.30 Eastern. There will be that hour before the exam starts. So the exam will be posted a little bit early, but the exam will start at um, 10.30. 10.30. The exam will start at 11.30 Eastern, 8.30 Pacific, okay? So are we allowed to like download and print it beforehand if you want to? Okay. I'll kind of make sure it's up there like 10 to 15 minutes early. So, okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I wanted to post it earlier this week and put like a restriction on it, but I couldn't figure out how to do that. So I read, I deleted it again right away. So it was only up there for like one minute. I don't think anybody saw it go up. So. I can answer any other questions you guys might have if you still have some, but thank you. I'm hearing a lot of silence. Okay. Thank you. So, good luck. Come in thank tomorrow you. with some last minute questions and thank you. You're welcome. This is, I just have one more question. Yeah. I have a question about 35. I've been searching through these slides for it, but I can't seem to find it. I need to look at my copy, my file, because I revised those just a little bit and I did put that in, in as a new question. So let me double check. Oh yeah, okay. So that was just trying to kind of summarize um, all of that information on the age of the earth. So the idea would be that samples of zircons can give us a minimum age for the Earth. So if there's zircons that we can date, and we can date them to around 4, 4.05 billion years, um, there might have been one or two that were a little bit older than that. But yes, there were some from Australia, I think, that were maybe like 4.1. Um, those were formed on the Earth. And so if those were formed on the earth, then the earth has to be at least that old. So those give us the minimum age for the earth. Well, meteorites give us the maximum age. And the meteorites give us the maximum age because those are thought to have cooled and formed in the solar system at the same time as the planets. So um, if other things in the solar system were formed at a specific time, then we know that the Earth can't have been formed before that. So those give us kind of the maximum age, okay? So they kind of bracket for us, and based off of a lot of those ages, ages of the meteorites, based off of um, what astronomers have been able to observe happening in terms of impacts on planets and other things happening, the thinking was that the Earth stayed molten for a few million years, a few hundreds of millions of years while other asteroids and stuff were impacting the surface. And so the zircons, not only did they give us a minimum age, but there was kind of some time added onto that based off of our understanding of what happens in the solar system. So that's that 4.54 plus or minus 0 0.05 billion years for the age of the earth. Okay. Yeah. So a quick, easy question, but I know it wasn't something that was necessarily explicit or typed out on the slides, so. I just have one more question. It yeah. just popped up into my head. 
So for problem D on the problem set, like the very, very first part, I think it, it was to calculate the number of the daughter nuclide. I think it was, oh, polonium 210. I was wondering where the uh, N, where the exponential term went in that okay went in that equation. So the sample of bismuth two ten freshly purified. So that means it's just bismuth two ten, left without further treatment. When will the amount of polonium two ten reach a maximum? Oh yeah, that was it. That part. So the T max. Or well, not the T. Sorry, go on. You go ahead. Not the T max. It was the daughter nuclide, like the number of polonium 210. At the time of max growth, what weight will be present? So like what number of atoms times? Yeah. Atoms? So, um, and your question about that was? I noticed that in the calculation for N2, there wasn't any mention of the exponential term. And I'm just wondering why that's so. You think that was a part I left off? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I'm just wondering like how like the logic behind that. I may not have written it all down because I think I had, so since I had the lambda one up here and I had the lambda two here and I solved for the T max and would have plugged that in for time, I don't, I may not have rewritten everything just because I already had all these values down. And what I would have written out here was just the calculation for the N1 naught. So let me double check real quick. Are you not getting the same answer or you're wanting to make sure you're calculating everything? Yeah, a bit of both. Okay. So E to the negative 0 0.13835 times 24.887. And because I knew the T max was days, that's why I chose to leave both of the lambdas in days. Um, minus E to the negative 0 0.00500913, probably overkill on sig figs. Um, so for the E terms for that subtraction, at least, so the E to the negative lambda 1T minus E to the negative lambda 2T, I have 1.32 about times 10 to the negative second. I got negative 0 0.8508. Oh, wait. If I wasn't doing that the whole time. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> so I didn't close my parentheses for the E for the exponent. So my calculator automatically opens one. So that could have been it. Let me go through and double check. So that was negative 0 0.851. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now that times my picograms times 6.022 e to the 23rd divided by 209.9841204 
is still negative 2.44 times 10 to the 11th, but then I multiply that by lambda 1, 0.13835, and divide by lambda 2 minus lambda 1, so 0 0.00500913 minus 0.13835. Um, I must have done it the right way, even though just now on my calculator I messed up. I still have 2.53 times 10 to the 11th atoms. Okay. For N2. That's not what you're getting though. I got something like 2.627. Times 10 to the 11th? Yeah. So it's probably just, that's close enough. Um, where you've basically got the right leading number, you've got the right exponent. That's probably just a difference in how we're plugging in our lambdas, how many okay. we're keeping for our lambdas. So that would be fine, okay? And then times the molar mass, and then there would be... So for all this stuff, because different people keep different amounts of decimals or plug things in exactly as they get them from their calculator, So you had something like 90 picograms or so? I had, oh, let's look at it again. I had something like 5.51 when I multiplied those two get together. So I don't know, like is there a conversion factor that I'm missing? Oh, um, and then I didn't write it down here, but of course, then you would also need to multiply by um, one mole over Avogadro's number, right? Okay. Yeah, because I also got the 5.3 times 10 to the 13th. Sorry, I'm sloppy, I guess, with trying to write everything out. That's okay. I mean, they should make pieces of the paper with larger width for equations. Oh, yeah. I got 8.8 times yeah. 10 to the 12th. That's it. So. <laughs> That's a side effect of doing it at 10 p.m. and at night. It happens. We used to work pretty late too as students. So, which site would you have been at, Brookhaven or San Jose? Brookhaven. Brookhaven, yeah. After being to both, I mean, California was nice, but the Brookhaven site was only like 25 minutes from the beach. So, we went to the beach a lot and studied on the beach or at least red on the beach. And the Atlantic Ocean is way warmer than the Pacific. So it was nice to actually swim at Brookhaven, so. What stuff I'm missing out on. So did you do something new at home this past weekend? Or will you do something new at home this coming weekend since I said, hey, you should go out and find something new to do. Find somewhere you haven't been and check it out. Not at the moment. Not a lot of stuff is open around here. Yeah. You're in Virginia or? South Dakota. Sioux South Falls. Dakota. Okay. Yeah. The town I'm in has a little like historical museum. I've actually never been inside, but if everything wasn't closed, I would sure try to do that. So I don't know. There's lots of, find a park you haven't been to and go hike. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, thank you. You're welcome.